Well, <laughs> we had so many unresolved issues. You know, there were so many outstanding things. The tensions were so high. Many of these people, we couldn't even put them in the same room. You know, they would, there were some physical fights about direction. I mean, the big momentum to the process of launching the Kosatu, irrespective of whether people wanted to be in or out, I think came from Elijah Baha'i. He made his most stirring speech at the last Unity Talks, just before the launch of Kosatu at the end of November in 1985, in which our theorists were really grinding on about policy direction. Do we want non-racialism or do we want anti-racialism? And I remember Baha'i in that meeting, Ipela Heng Center, you know, he stands up and he speaks in Sutu, in, in, sorry, he speaks in Kosa. And he makes this wonderful speech, you know. I can remember it so clearly, him saying, you know, punch his finger. You know, these people here that are talking about what the future federation is and about what black workers want. I am from the mining sector. I am a mine worker. You all talk English here. So who are you talking on behalf? I'm a mine worker. I want this federation right now. So if you want to inte intellectualize about the federation for years to come, do it. But we, from the NUM, we are saying we want the federation now. Close the debate. So then you were in or you were out. And so no one wanted to be left out. But this time we had made contact with the, with the ANC outside the country. And you know, there was an emerging consensus that the unions that had been more community-based, more political, more coming out of the tradition of SACTU and al aligned to the UDF, which had then been launched, will come into the unions. And I think I, I, we were very supportive of that because I really did believe that we could weld together these different traditions and create a character and content for the union movement ourselves out of it. And so we arrived in, 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 Durban, uh, in Durban. These busloads of people are arriving right through the night. Uh, we all assemble in the University of Natal, one of the few venues that we could get. There are thousands of these delegates. There are many unanswered questions. It ends up in a debate on everything. Do we call this a congress or a federation? Do we have this logo with this representing men or do we integrate women? Do we have a woman in the top leadership? Uh, you know, every issue was a debate. And, and the tensions were so high that I was thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm the slate now to be general secretary. What are we building here? You know, if the tensions are so high in the Congress, imagine trying to build an organization like this. And so, yes, that was the first day. But there was an energy there. You know, there was a fiery energy. You know, and I felt that if we capture this thing, we, could, we can mold it into something powerful. So when Cyril makes a stirring speech, you know, we are creating a giant today, a giant that will dominate the landscape. And shame, man, he's quite sick. And so he has to be there because he's the convener of the conference. And so, yes, the moment I'm elected, you know, it's euphoria and so forth. And I remember after that night, I'm elected and we're then walking home. I'm walking home with, uh, with Howie Gabriels to a place that I lived a few kilometers away. And we're taking a walk. And we thought about it, you know, what are we getting into? 
and it was a very clear night. Stars were visible. It was a beautiful night. And I said to Howie, Howie, we've really got to build some things here. But I just look at the challenges we have. You know, we have no money. We have no bank account. I don't have one person employed. We have this tension that we've seen in this Congress, and we've got to fashion an organization out of this. How are we going to do this? It was a crowded church hall. There were hundreds of people there. I was probably 15 years old, and I went to the meeting with my brother, who was in, studying to be a teacher and had come into contact with the black consciousness movement. It was the late 60s. And we arrived in this church hall. It was a hot, steaming summer day, tropical in Durban, humid. And this hall was packed. It was the Lutheran church, you know, one of the few churches that really offered us the, the meeting spaces. And the front row, I can remember clearly, were these guys in big overcoats with a, a bulge under their armpits, you know, where they had their guns. It was the security police. And then in walks Steve Biko, and man, you know, a mandla, and this hall reverberates, you know. And this is this motion that is so tangible. And he talks about this thing, you know, we have a choice in our lives to be ruled or to rule ourselves. There's a clear division between being black and being white. And what we need to do is assert our humanity, our rights as human beings. And so, yes, you know, I mean, he, he captured my imagination. I mean, he provided me the platform to channel my anger. Otherwise, I could have ended up a social delinquent. You know, that's the direction I was going in, you know. And so I found a reason to live and to fight. And I remember the end of that meeting, he didn't stop him. He was undeterred by the fact that those security police could have arrested him, put him into a car, and taken him away for a long time, like they did when they murdered him. And so he inspired me. It was just like the light suddenly revealed itself, the truth to me. And, and I found my cause. When I went to volunteer at, at Fosato, I arrived at the office with Jay and Naidu. Because we had both made the decision that we would like to experiment with something different. And we had been reading a lot of Marxist literature about the role of the working class. And in fact, we had now graduated from black consciousness. Because black consciousness could not, at the end of the day, answer the fundamental questions that we had. What is apartheid? And it wasn't just about racial discrimination. Racial discrimination was the form it took. The real core of apartheid was a cheap labor system. And so that was the, the issue we had to answer. And so we reached a point where we were confident young black activists. And we wanted to go to the next stage. We wanted to ask the question, well, how do we understand apartheid, and what do we want to replace apartheid with? And what are the fundamental principles on which we want to construct a new South Africa? And it had to be about non-racialism. It had to be about the class divisions in our society, about the exploitative relationship between the, the, the bosses and the workers, the challenge of a homeland with labor reservoirs where they dump people that they did not need. And so, understanding all of that meant that you really had to ask 
go beyond black consciousness. And so, yes, we are attracted to the idea that we are beginning to, in working with the trade unions, beginning to interface with the working class. But we knew that Fusatu was very hostile to political activism of the past because an open association with politics would smash a very embryonic trade union movement. And that's the lesson we had learned from the past. And the union movement that had emerged, that took the form of Fosatu or any of the other unions, really had its origins in the wages commissions and in the role that Marxist white intellectuals played. Influenced very much by the thinking of, of Rick Turner, Professor Rick Turner. And so the roots of the modern trade union movement had that as one of its, of its inputs that really came much through the road, through Fasatu. And when I interfaced with that, I understood that. And so I pretended to be completely non-political. I had no association with the community struggles or student struggles. I was there as a volunteer. I had to go through an interview process, you know. I, had to, I was then asked to go and meet Johnny Copeland. I had to meet Alec Irwin. I had to be approved. <laughs> so I got it. But once I was inside, I was a volunteer, unpaid volunteer. I had to go and organize a factory, Beacon Suites. And I remember having to be there from four in the morning till ten at night, day after day after day. And then you would have, a, you know, from the place where the workers got off the bus to the factory gate, which is about 200 meters, to develop the storyline as to how you want to now get workers to join the union. It was tough. And then the, the company started to victimize workers. They started to photograph workers. They almost ran me down with the car, the, the, the chief executive of the, of, the, of the business. And then workers were terrified. Didn't want to accept any pamphlets. Said, you know what? You're going to get me into jail. You're going to get me dismissed. So you had to deal with that. And so eventually we used the community organizing tactics. As soon as I could identify someone who was uh, more amenable to talking, I'd say, okay, can I meet you at home? So I'd go into the communities and organize them. But we got smashed because the company started to dismiss key people. And I learned an important lesson in my life. It takes an incredibly long time to build an organization. It can take just one act of rashness to destroy an organization overnight. I met with Prof. Seneca, was a remarkable young man. And he was working in a textile factory called South African Fabrics. So we got to be friends, and really good friends, you know. So yeah, I was chatting to him, and he said to me, hey, why don't you come and work in the factory? And I said, wow, fantastic. I'd love to work in a factory. I mean, yeah, I'm organizing work because I've never worked in a factory. So, he made a plan, and I got a job. And I remember the first day of my, my formal work on a factory floor. I had worked in shops before and whatever else as an odd person here and there. But this, on the factory floor, this was my first experience. And it was amazing. I remember arriving there. It was 12-hour shifts from 6 to 6. I was doing the night shift. So during the day, I was still involved in a bit of other work, and I really thought, well, I'll... You know, I don't need to sleep. I can get there at 6 and 12-hour you know, shift should be okay. So I arrive at the factory. I get taken to my station. It's a textile factory. The factory is really segregated. You have departments just of Indian workers and departments just of African workers. They have separate chain rooms. Everything is like you know, racialized within the factory floor. So I get put to work with this operator. There's a row of machines, but each machine has hundreds of needles. 
And as the clot is coming out, my job is if a needle breaks, I've got to stop the machine so the needle can be replaced. And the guy who's the operator says to me, Hey, Sonny, you better pay attention here. Yeah. So if you don't, I'm going to kick you out through that front door. I say, yes, sir. Really, I'm really wanting to work. I'll be a very good worker. So I am working now. So I, yeah, my role is to walk up and down these machines and stop it if I see a, a thread is now missing. Which is fine. It's an easy job to do, you know. So I'm walking up and down. Shit, man, it's getting to 12 o'clock. I am now sleepwalking. I am so tired. So I'm getting into trouble because some needles are breaking and I'm not catching it. So we have a half an hour break, 12 o'clock. I sleep. They have to shake me up to get me up in the morning. <laughs> so I get up and then I carry on doing it. So I'm in a lot of trouble by the morning because I've buggered up some important material, you know. So anyway, I get back home and I fall asleep. They have to shake me at you know, time to get up. I didn't even get up to eat. And I think, oh my God, am I going to go back to this? And I don't know, something inside me said, yes, get your butt out of here and get to this factory. And I did that. And I worked there for a few months. And eventually, I worked with this colleague of mine, Prof. Seneca, and Andrew Joyce, who was another key activist in the, in the factory. And we organized this factory. Nineteen eighty seven was a decisive year in the history of trade unionism. Tens of thousands of railway workers went on strike, demanding the right to trade unionism and rejecting the sweetheart union that the management was imposing on them. And it revolved around the dismissal, arbitrary dismissal of one worker. And so it was a very brutal strike because here we were hitting right at the heart of the apartheid state. There was a brutal response of evicting people from hostels, of dismissing thousands of people. And the leadership of the union, which had recently been launched, was very new and were immediately detained. So we had a strike on our hands with tens of thousands of workers. We had a brutal state saying, now you are coming to the heart of the apartheid state and we will not tolerate this. We had a very new leadership amongst workers. And you know, it just turned nasty. And so the Kosato House, which was now established almost as the center and hive of activity that housed many of the trade unions, became a meeting place. Thousands of workers converging in it and meeting in the halls downstairs and surrounded by police every day and clashes between police and the workers. And the management was intransigent. They had dismissed people. They were not prepared to negotiate with Kosato. The, the state broadcaster, SABC, was attacking us every day. And things started to go out of hand. And so that's when we intervened as Kosato. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, it ends up in violence. First of all, the state assaults us. Uh, on Kosato House. They conduct a military ass assault on us. They kill a number of workers in the Germiston offices. And then workers retaliate and attack the police. It ends up with the deaths of certain workers that had scabbed. It was an unmitigated disaster. You know, it was going nowhere. It was a strike that was brutal and it was no holds barred. It was like a war. In fact, the police cars outside, one of them painted an AWB sign on it saying, we're coming to get you. So, you know, 
they, they continued over that period to be a series of military assaults on Kosato head office. And uh, eventually, using Cheadle Thompson and Hasem, our lawyers, and, and using the law, we were able to exploit a loophole in the law that said the dismissal of those workers was illegal and not in compliance with the law of that govern uh, Transnet at that time. And so we won on a technicality and got reinstatement. It, it was really important that we won that battle and that the state was then forced into negotiations with us around recognition. And so that was a victory again, that we got the reinstatement, we won some rights, we took some power away from them, and the union was now recognized as one of the representatives of the workers. So I think that was an amazing victory. And the back of that then you know, comes a severe state reaction. You know, the SABC is now full swing in its propaganda attack against us. And uh, the state then decides that it needs to create a disruption in the, uh, in the operations of Kosato. They bomb Kosato House. And the attempt, and what came up in the, uh, in the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where the then Minister of, of Police applies for amnesty, because he authorized the bombing of Kosato House using operatives from FAC Plus, the hit squads of the apartheid regime. And they apply for indemnity saying Kosato was seen as a threat to national security. And what we know from Eugene de Kock, you know, the, uh, the, one of the chief assassins and heads of the death squads, is that this was discussed at the highest level of government, including the president and the state security council. Kosatu was a threat that had to be dealt with. And when they talk about being dealt with, it means removed. It was a long, painstaking process to build the union movement up. It used to take years to organize a factory or a, a mine. But ultimately, those workers became leaders. And those leaders had power because they had the skills to negotiate on what their rights were. And what happened is that we took power, arbitrary power, away from the employers. We forced them into negotiations on agreements that equalize power between the workers and the employers. And that's about how we won rights to eventually have the right to strike and labor rights in a constitution of the new South Africa in 1994. I think much of it has to come back to values. Because if one looks at the role that we played in the struggle for freedom, it was defined by service, selfless service. It was about a volunteerism. I started my, my work in the trade union movement as a volunteer. And so if one looks at that, and one says, okay, what are the values that today underpin our society? Not just in South Africa, but globally. It's the values of individualism, of uh, accumulation, of greed, and that achievement really is how wealthy you are. The values have changed from that of a celebration of service, and social solidarity to the values of accumulation as the height of human achievement. And that's what causes poverty today. It was 
a debate that took place in the 80s, very much driven uh, by the fact that there was this emerging power of, uh, of free market enterprise in, and capitalism that really knew no bounds. And if one really looks at the, the cutting point, the watershed, was the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And that, in a sense, brought out, I think, the worst of human access. Because then the view was, if you fail, it's your own fault. And I think it comes back to those values, that what we started to worship was these high-flying executives who became enormously wealthy in the world. And that's the model we based ourselves on. So if you go to our universities today, you go around the world, the model is trying to replicate that. How does one become wealthy overnight? Not through hard work, not through human endeavor, not through building things in a systematic way and making the sacrifices that one has to make, but that one can become wealthy overnight. And I think that's what has happened in the, in the world today. If we really look at it, we need $350 million to solve malnutrition, micronutrient malnutrition that affects 2 billion people in the world, that kills almost 3.5 million children a year, that stunts the growth and permanently damages over 200 million young people in the world. And yet, we can't find the money. But we'll find trillions of dollars to solve a banking crisis where the executives can go back to earning those enormous bonuses that they have after they've used the taxpayers' money. It's about priorities and about values. And if we really want to look at the question of what are the values that are most appreciated in the world and celebrated, do a survey of who are the people that, that people respect, who are the leaders that are respected today, who are the leaders that are celebrated as the height of human achievement. And eight out of ten times, it will be the same people. It will be Nelson Mandela, it will be Archbishop Tutu, it will be Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King. But these people were never billionaires. They were no, not the world's brightest scientists or the engineering geniuses that we have in the world today. They were celebrated because of their selfless contribution to humanity, to social solidarity, to the identification with those that are vulnerable, those that are marginalized, those that are poor. And so that's what we need to go back to, the values that someone iconic like Mandela represents, because that's what the world yearns for people who care. And if I look around the world today, I find a global leadership that doesn't really care about the poor. They care about protecting vested interests, protecting a system that perpetuates inequality and poverty in the world. <laughs>